Now let's go over the elaborate section. Number 11 is pretty easy. It's just a reminder of exactly what your data told you at the beginning of the lab. Number 12 refers to this figure of the national parks. So these are all our national parks in the United States, which you learn about in chapter 12. If you'll notice, they are concentrated in the Western United States. And there's a historical reason for that that you learn about really in AP history oh, and actually regular US history as well. It has to do with westward expansion. So we settled the East Coast in the 1600s and we moved slowly west over time. And then after the Civil War, we settled with the Homestead Act, the middle of our country, up until the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then we went, oh, wait, we're settling the whole country. There's some beautiful places. Wildlife painters and photographers will go over here, take pictures, send them back east and go, look at what's here. We need to save it. And so they created national parks. Um, the first one was created in the 1880s, which was Yellowstone, but they really got a big ramp of the number of they saved, a ramp up um, in the early 1900s. I think uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a big part of that. And um, so most of the land that was not sold off or given away to settlers was in the Western United States. So the reason why we have most of the national parks in the United States was because the land that was left to save happened to be more in the West than the East, which was already settled. So we're very, very lucky here in California that we have about 10 national parks within a day's drive. You can get to Sequoia in four hours, Kings Canyon um, in you know, four and a half, Yosemite in about six hours. You can get to the Channel Islands in about an hour drive to the coast and then about um, an hour and a half boat ride. Joshua Tree is about three hours south. Death Valley is about four hours north and east. Zion's about a seven hour drive. Grand Canyon's about a six hour drive. So and Bryce is maybe an eight hour drive. So we're really, really lucky that we have so many national parks that we can drive to um, in a day. All right, so this theory of island bio biogeography theory, which of these national parks would have the most biodiversity? Think about it for a minute. I hope you said the big ones. Yellowstone. Up here in Alaska are some very big ones. Denali. Wrangell, St. Elias. But what about the smaller ones that are clumped together? In Utah, you have Capitol Reef, Arches, Bryce, Zion, Canyonlands. They're smaller, but they're clumped. So that kind of refers to the distance of, from the mainland, right? These are not real islands in the ocean. These are islands of habitat on the continent. What about up here? We have kind of a clump in the Cascade Mountains, North Cascades, Mount Rainier, Olympic. I've been to all three. Went to Mount Rainier two, about a year and a half ago. It was uh, absolutely amazing. So the smaller ones that are close together, even here, Yosemite, Kings Canyon, Sequoia, they're going to be close enough that your species can go between them. A lot of species, not all, but a lot of species can go between them. So they're going to have more biodiversity. The next question. Number 13, if Congress asked you to choose a location for a new national park and one of the primary concerns was pre preserving biodiversity with this theory, where would you locate it? So just based on this theory, Let's talk about some other answers that aren't based on the theory, so don't write them down. A lot of students will say, we need to have one in the middle of the United States because they don't have one there and we need to protect the species in the middle of the United States, Kansas, Nebraska. Yes, that's a good idea, but it's not the correct answer for this question because it, there's, not, there's no big ones that surround it. 
So you're going to have very limited biodiversity. Even if you protect the land, you're going to have very limited biodiversity. Sometimes students say, well, down in Florida, because it's tropical or subtropical, and <clears throat> um, there, that usually means more biodiversity of species. That is also true that there are, is more biodiversity in subtropical and tropical regions. And if you place that national park right down here next to the Everglades and Biscayne, um, that would make sense. So that might be an okay as long as you placed it next to the others. Um, what if you said the Channel Islands because of endemic species? So yes, there is a lot of endemic species at the Channel Islands National Park, like the Channel Islands fox is one. So that is a good place to preserve species. But if we are focusing our question just on this theory and preserving and really upping the number of species, where would you place it? You'd want to place it next to other big ones. So maybe over here in California in this cluster of kind of big ones, not that big, but kind of big national parks, Yosemite, Kings Canyon, Sequoia, Death Valley, maybe here next to Yosemite I'm sorry, Yellowstone and Grand Tetons. On a side note, did you know they're trying to buy land to connect Glacier and Yellowstone National Parks so that the species there, like the grizzly bears, can travel between safely? Right now, it's private land with ranchers and, um, and their, their cattle, and they don't want grizzly bears roaming between those two national parks. There's, there's grizzly bears in very few places left in the whole United States. Um, they used to roam California shores. Isn't that amazing? But um, they were hunted to extinction in most states, except for in this area. It's called the Greater Yellowstone Area Ecosystem. Anyway, um, there's land groups trying to buy land to connect Glacier National Parks with Yellowstone. So those two grizzly bear populations can travel and breed and prevent bottleneck effect um, for species. And up into Canada, too, because there's grizzlies in Canada. So there's more national parks up in Canada that they want to connect as well. It's called a wildlife corridor. It's not done yet, but they're working on it. Or another national park in Alaska near these other large national parks. So those are the best answers for number 13. Number 14 asks you to look at wildlife corridors. Number 15, we now you can think about other things that influence biodiversity, like uh, tropical regions. Um, so that's latitude near the equator. The more water there is, the more endemic species there are. So those are other things that influence biodiversity. And then at the end, go ahead and write a chunk paragraph. Chunk paragraph is only about five to seven complex sentences. So it's not a huge end to this lab. So I hope that helps you answer the questions. This lab, it, it has some difficult questions and it is um, a little bit of complex thinking.